Hi, it's Mr. Mac, and today we're going to learn a little bit about projectile motion and go through a couple of worked examples. We'll learn that what goes up must come down. Welcome to Mr. Mac's physics channel. He can explain things really well and is a lot of fun to watch. These two are on the screen. Um, the simplest case of projectile motion is when a ball is thrown directly upwards, a ball or anything really, thrown directly upwards. We've already seen that. Um, Ignoring air resistance, the only force acting on the ball is due to gravity, so the ball accelerates downwards. As it increases in height, as you're throwing it up, the velocity slows down until it comes to a stop. Now, it comes to a stop instantaneously, which means it doesn't actually, in our view, stop. It's not like the coyote in Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote, where he runs off a cliff, and just stops there until he realizes he's about to fall and then he falls. But whatever it happens to be, will return to the ground with the same velocity that it's projected. Well, okay, to be fair, the same velocity will be where, at, when it reaches the level that uh, the person's holding in the hand. Um, so it'll return to the downward direction and the speed will be the same, but in the opposite direction. Okay. That's the symmetry of projectile motion. Uh, so let's have a look at worked example five. Remember, get out pen and paper so you can start writing this down. And yeah. equation for the time of flight of a projectile launched from the ground and lands back on the ground. Hence, show that the time of flight depends only on the vertical component of the projectile's initial velocity and the angle it is projected. That's the angle from the horizontal. Okay, so derive the equation. Now you do have to, in physics, be able to derive equations. You do have to be able to manipulate algebraic formulae. You do have to um, be able to substitute and rearrange to find different answers. So, my job is to present that to you in a way that you can easily understand so that it doesn't become, oh no, I don't know how to do this. I can't do it. It is actually easily doable, okay? And when we derive things, I'll give you some hints as to where to start. So we're ready to go. The first thing is to say that the total time a projectile spends in the air is called the time of flight. Now we covered this the other day, but just to remind yourself that it's a definition. And so here's the data. Displacement in the y direction initially is zero. The acceleration in the y direction is negative g, in other words, negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And the initial velocity in the y direction is u sine theta. Remember, that's one of those formulas that you have to learn, remember, and it's not on your formula sheet. So once we got the data, let the time of flight be t. Now I've used capital T to distinguish it from the variable little t. So we're actually going to call capital T an, a, pronumeral, a pronumeral, which means it's standing in place of a numeral. Here's our equation. S equals ut plus a half at squared and notice the y subscripts. Since acceleration is only in the y direction, so is the displacement and the velocity. We're only dealing in the y direction. Substituting, we've got zero, we've got u sine theta. We're replacing little t with capital T and minus a half gt squared. So this is where the negative comes in. And we need to actually put it in here and understand that g is 9.8 meters per second squared. It's also a pronumeral. And we'll just factorize. So here's one of those uh, junior maths skills that we need. Take t out as a common factor. And if you know in pure maths, you have to assume then that t uh, doesn't equal zero. We're not interested in t equals zero because 
that's the launch time. We want to find the time of flight. So we're not interested in the first term or the, the, the first factor. We're interested in more in what's in the brackets. So we'll ignore the first term, the first uh, factor. When we take the factor that's in the brackets and equate that with zero, we can then say a half GT equals U sine theta. Now, by the way, that's the same process that you would do if you were solving a simple quadratic formula. Now we're getting close to finding the time of flight because now we need to multiply both sides by two and divide by G. In other words, we're making T the subject. It's all by itself on the left-hand side. So T equals 2U sine theta over G. So this only depends on the vertical component of the projectile's initial velocity, that's U sine theta, and the angle it's projected, assuming G is constant. And the faster the projectile is thrown up, the longer it will stay in the air. And that's our derivation. Here we see a picture of a projectile that's launched horizontally. In this case, it's height h above the ground. It's got initial velocity u, which by the way, also equals ux. And uy in this case is zero. So the initial velocity in the y direction is zero. So it's one of those situations where you flick a, say a, a marble, off a desk and as it rolls along, it then has a certain velocity, initial velocity. And that UX stays the same throughout the time of flight. Okay. You can see that we've got G is downwards on the diagram and we've got V at any point along the trajectory and notice that V changes. And we've got D, that's the distance that it lands from the bottom of the desk or the table or the cliff or whatever it happens to be. So if a ball is launched horizontally from the end of the table, it doesn't drop vertically downwards as soon as it clears the table, but follows a parabolic trajectory. But here's worked example six. So we're using the same diagram and that's up on the top left. We'll come back to exercise set two in a minute. Imagine the helicopter that was described in work example four is not stationary. Remember the one that dropped from 100 meters, the package? But this time it's flying at a speed of 20 meters per second and is 100 meters above the ground when the package is dropped. In work example four, we found that the time it takes is 4.52 seconds for the package to hit the ground. Can you guess? how long it's gonna take now that the helicopter is flying horizontally at a speed of 20 meters per second, how long will it take for the package to hit the ground? It, the time that it takes to reach the ground, whether it's dropped or whether it has a horizontal velocity, it's the same height. So it'll take the same amount of time. So it'll be 4.52 seconds. Let's have a look at that with our example. Uh, the question is, we want to find the range of the package. In other words, from the moment of release, what is the distance along the ground that it gets to before it hits, as it hits, when it hits. <laughs> okay, so the data is UX, 20 meters per second. So that's the new bit of information. The helicopter is flying at speed 20 meters per second. The SY, remember we're using negative 100 meters. And the reason for that is the displacement from the point of release to the ground is downwards. So the displacement is negative. The time is 4.52 seconds. There is no subscript for time. So the time that it takes for the package to reach the ground works in both directions, so to speak, whether we're looking horizontally or vertically. And that's the key for all projectile motion questions that are two-dimensional. The time is the link for both components. So we're required to find SX, that's the displacement in the X direction or the range. 
So yes, we do use SX equals UXT, and we do need to learn that formula because it's not on the formula sheet. And we need to substitute. So it's simply velocity times time. So the horizontal velocity 20. And remember that, that horizontal velocity is constant throughout projectile motion. And times the 4.52 to give us 90.4 meters. Generally, projectiles are shot, thrown, or driven at some angle to the horizontal. Driven, I'm thinking of golfing, where you get a club and you drive the ball down the fairway. The initial velocity must be resolved into its horizontal and vertical components to analyze the, the motion. So that we're just going to get used to using V cos theta for horizontal component, V sine theta for the vertical component. So given the velocity of a projectile when it's launched V, both components can be found by trigonometry. And I've been saying Vx equals V cos theta and Vy equals V sine theta that you just must learn. For example, a bullet fired at an upward angle of 30 degrees, and that means 30 degrees to the horizontal, at a speed of 400 meters per second, has an initial horizontal speed of Ux equals 400 cos 30, which equals 346 meters per second, and initial vertical speed of Uy equals 400 sine 30, which is 200 meters per second. The position and velocity of any projectile at any moment in time can be determined by the equations of motion. And this is the key point. This diagram is very useful to say that parabolic motion is symmetric. For a projectile fired from ground level and returning to ground level at the end of its flight, the trajectory of the projectile is symmetric. Now, symmetric is really important because we can use properties of symmetry to solve some of the problems. So here are some tips for solving projectile motion questions. Draw a diagram. That's the first point. That's the most important thing in projectile motion. Once you draw a diagram, you then see where the information is. You work out the data, you work out directions. So from now on, whenever we're doing a projectile motion question, whether it's a simple question or a problem to solve, we need to draw a diagram. Second point is to separate out the vertical and horizontal components. So this is the strategy that we follow. The third step is to resolve the initial velocity into its components. And the fourth step is to take the time of flight as the link between the vertical and horizontal components. So T is the same whether you're looking at the vertical component or the horizontal component. And fifthly, when we found an answer, always check to see if your answer is reasonable. Okay, so here's an example of projectile motion. Now this is simply a graph with X's on it, but you can see it's just, um, you can see it is a displacement time graph. The graph shows the vertical displacement of a projectile through its trajectory. The range of the projectile is 130 meters. Now, this graph, remember, is displacement versus time. But we're told that the range is 130 meters. So just get in your picture, what is this graph telling us? What is it not telling us? If this is not a displacement versus horizontal displacement graph. Okay, the question is to calculate the initial velocity of the projectile. So to find the initial velocity, and we're going to call that U with an arrow above it, so it's a vector, we need to find Ux first, so the horizontal component of the initial velocity. Here's the data. SX, we're told in the question is 130 meters. The time is six seconds from the graph. And the velocity in the X direction is what we need to find. So we use SX equals UXT. Remember, we need to learn that one. 
and substitute 130 equals ux times 6. Dividing by 6, we get 21.7 metres per second. Now, you'll find that it's 0.6 repeater. Leave that on your calculator. Learn how to use the memory on your calculator to find ui. And again, here we will do the data again as though this is a second part or a second question. At the highest point, at t equals 3 seconds, remember the velocity in the y direction is instantaneously zero. So there's a bit of information that we know, but is not explicitly said in the question. We know that a in the y direction is negative 9.8, and we need to find u in the y direction. So we found ux, we need to find uy, and then we'll combine the both to find the initial velocity. So everything's in the y direction for this, and we've used information from the symmetry of the parabola. So if the total flight is six seconds, to the highest point is three seconds. And we're going to use v equals u plus at. It's a nice simple one. Again, it's a in the y direction, so u and v are also in the y direction. Substituting, we've got zero at that halfway point equals ui minus 9.8 times 3. Rearranging, we just multiply, uh, actually just taking them across to the other side. We find that ui is 29.4 metres per second exactly. We've got two components now in the x and the y direction. We can now find u, uh, which is the velocity vector. So we just do the vector sum. And to do the vector sum, we find the magnitude using Pythagoras theorem. So substituting u squared equals 21.7 squared plus 29.4 squared. Remember to use your memory on the calculator. Add them together, take the square root, and you get 36.5 meters per second. Now to find the angle, remember a vector has both magnitude and direction. We need to use some trigonometry. So we'll use tan, which is opposite over hypotenuse. The opposite is the ui and the hypotenuse is the ux in this case. So it's 29.4 over 21.7. Take the inverse tan and we get 54 degrees. Usually when we're dealing with angles, we round to the nearest degree, unless told otherwise. So the initial velocity, u, is 36.5 metres per second at an elevation of 54 degrees, or you could say at an angle of 54 degrees above the horizontal. So there we've seen a couple of examples of projectile motion calculation questions and you should be able to work through those and be more comfortable with the formulae and how to work those out. Remember to subscribe to Mr. Mac's physics channel. I'm Mr. Mac. Thanks for watching.